I think non-binary to me is getting to have autonomy of choice. I feel like it's a removal of the rules and like the rigidness. For me personally, there's always been an element of dysphoria that comes with being non-binary. You don't have to physically like surgery or, mm-hmm. or, or be on hormones mm-hmm. to have like mm-hmm. gender affirming practice. Yeah. I see a lot of guys who get like jaw filler. Girl, you want to look more mask. Like yeah. that's you yeah. gender affirming. <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with supporting a kid in terms of them knowing more mm. about the world. A dangerous thing would be knowing not enough. Ooh. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Queer Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Carvin. I'm Emily. I'm Halal. And I'm Heath. And welcome to the show. And this episode is sponsored by Vizzy Hard Seltzer, but more on that later. Pink or blue, Barbies or cars, the arts or sports. Society likes to sort things into two rigid categories, man or woman. But what if those boxes don't fit you? This episode delves into the world of non-binary identities, exploring multiple experiences. Along with our guests, we'll unravel the unique experiences of non-binary folks from navigating societal expectations to the complexities of gender dysphoria. And with us today, we have Heath V. Salazar, who is an award-winning Latin multidisciplinary performer and writer. Named a prophylic trans artist by CBC Arts, they've developed developed a body of work in theater and film that spans the gender spectrum and are also the internationally recognized drag king, Gay Jesus, Their Holiness. <laughs> they can be spotted as Arrow on CBC's and HBO Max's original series, Sort Of, and as one of Queer Collective's Out Loud artists in The Birth of Gay Jesus, which also features their original poetry and sound design. Heath, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Our next guest is Halal Bey, who uses her platform and performances to celebrate queer culture and as a drag activist, critiquing current social constructs and issues facing our community. A Muslim-born North African Levante queen, she has been on Canada's Drag Race, Pride Toronto, and across the country, spreading her message of acceptance and fighting against bigotry. She's known for her signature aesthetic, political work, and comedic hosting. Thank you both so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. To start this out, because we have so many varying experiences with gender and non-binary sitting around this table, I wanted to give everyone a brief idea of where everyone's at with their gender and sexuality. For me, Emily, I'm newly exploring my gender and came out as non-binary a few months ago after kind of like confidently feeling like I'm a woman for all of my life. And I'm currently using they, she pronouns and I'm also bisexual, but like it's many layers associated with this that I'll be like exploring throughout the episode. Pass it over to you, Hall. Sweet. Well, I go by he, they pronouns, primarily primarily because of the way that I look. It's really hard to navigate the world without having that Mm -hmm. identity. I came out as non-binary probably in like 2018. I've always been kind of gender bending my entire life and didn't really have a word for it until I started doing drag professionally. I am also pan, but I would also say that that's a new identity for me as well. I say them pronouns. I'm non-binary. Like the terms I use publicly are like trans non-binary mm-hmm. and like bisexual and queer and pan kind of like all mm-hmm. lived together. Mm-hmm. Agender is like the most specific term I can use. And then in terms of attraction, I'm just attracted to queer people. Carbon here. <laughs> If you're listening at home, (laughs) I use the pronouns she, her, as well as they, them. I would identify as a lesbian. Gender and sexuality is a really interesting topic that I'm excited to explore today. This next piece that we're going to enter into is really talking about everything around the non-binary experience, dysphoria, and socialization. But I really wanted to start with the basics, and I'm wondering if both of you can take a jab at explaining what it means to be non-binary. It's really different for everyone. I think everyone's Mm -hmm. relationship to it's really different, mainly because our relationship to gender in general is really different. In terms of media, the way it's represented is always within like one very specific context, a very like white androgynous like skinny Mm. context. Like it's Mm. very weird the way that media has decided to be like, okay, we see it. But just like this, Mm -hmm. in terms of like a vague overarching theme of it would be that it's an identity that lives outside of the specific binaries Mm -hmm. and like roles within society and finding a sense of self rather than an outside source. Hello. What would you say like being non-binary is to? Yeah. For me, it really is about like embracing the gray in life, which kind of mimics sexuality. Like everything's Mm -hmm. on a spectrum. And I think that your identity, your gender expression is Mm -hmm. also on a spectrum. And I don't think that there's sort of like one look. I think that there's an emphasis in society to be like, so if you're non-binary, then you don't have to attribute to either. And you Mm -hmm. have to be in this like other third space, but you can still occupy those spaces. Because it's so new, there's like that idea of like what that person looks like, of being Mm -hmm. like skinny, white. And I don't think that intersectionality has caught up yet with what it means to be non-binary. To me, I feel it's 
a very rebellious term. As someone who feels like very, very political, like at my core, it feels like a rejection of everything that like man and women is that I dislike and like don't align with. I very much embody both masculinity and femininity. It's a scale that I feel like I move along constantly, but I, I feel like it's a removal of the rules and like the rigidness. Right. And that's kind of like what's resonated with me throughout like the past few months of like figuring this out. And it was actually someone else like pointing out to me, like I wore something feminine and I'd always seen myself as a feminine person, but they were like, oh my God, you look so feminine today. And I was like, I didn't the other few days. And I was like, oh, I can, I'm masculine. I can like be masculine sometimes. And that's when I started like taking myself out of these boxes that I realized I was like, I'm a femme. Like for so long, I'm like, I'm a femme lesbian for a while. And it's like, no, you yeah. don't have to be that person. Or a bottom. For the longest time. True, I was ah. a bottom. You, no, but the assumption was that you could only be a bottom because yeah. you were so femme presenting uh, yeah. as right. well, yeah. which is also like an interesting thing that like, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people like struggle with or mm -hmm. like yeah. have a hard time yeah. existing outside of. There's all these assumptions that the more delicate one, mm -hmm. for a lack of a better words, and I'm using air quotes, <laughs> <So> delicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is like the one that's supposed to be like submissive. It doesn't have to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. It's not true anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited for an era of delicate tops. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. This is for all my delicates. Okay. Next, we want to get into the question of what non-binary looks like. As we know, it can look like a lot of things, but what does it look like to you personally? Heath, we'll start with you. I think non-binary to me is getting to have autonomy of choice in terms of presentation like for myself. It changes every day. Also someone who's like transitioned on testosterone like it's really funny because in terms of presentation I knew I would eventually read as a man mm -hmm. societally and therefore like wanted to like pre-sort through relationship to like future privilege and like what mm -hmm. that would be like. But I didn't realize it never occurred to me that I would stop reading as a woman which like mm -hmm. sounds really funny mm -hmm. but I was like oh yeah people will always know I can like walk my friends home now, like my friends who present as female and be like, you're gonna be safe just because I have a beard. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like, it's terrible in terms of like the reality yeah. of privilege, but I'm also yeah. like, uh -huh. I'm gonna walk you home. And they're like, you can't yeah. fight anyone. You're just like, like don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like that has been fun. And it's also like, it's been, being able to like deconstruct and redefine for myself like my relationship to body my relationship to like mm -hmm. what it means to be mask or femme like these mm -hmm. ideas i think often as non-binary people we're taught to kind of like prove our non-binariness through representation yeah. versus being like okay well what do i actually like pre-t i felt like i had to censor a lot of my relationship to femininity because of misgendering and then mm -hmm. Auntie, then all of a sudden I was like, yeah, I can paint my nails now. And I was like, yeah. why didn't mm. that relationship get to be there before? Because mm. I'm like, it doesn't have anything to do with nail polish. It's like, what are the ways in which I'm not allowing myself to either like the things I enjoy or mm. like celebrate the things that I like because of how they might read? How about you? I don't really have an answer for like what it looks like mm. for me. I use the term genderqueer for myself is because I used to either present very mask or very femme and it wasn't until recently where I got comfortable in like blurring those lines and not being so rigid in like how I present and so I, I think it is just trying to find that balance and be accepted in that space mm -hmm. and not feel like I'm taking up that space either I feel like there's definitely a lot to prove not only to yourself but to mm -hmm. everybody else that you are non-binary the advent of non-binary like the definition the acceptance in society is quite new and so I think that there's going to be a lot more people that are still going to have to go through that and really start to question what it actually looks like mm -hmm. um, and I'm still in that phase it's interesting because for me I don't fully feel like what the societal standard is of a woman. I also don't feel like a man, mm -hmm. but I also like messing with people's definition of a woman, which is why I still use mm. she, her pronouns as well. Right. Like, That's the reason that I kept my facial hair and I have my mustache mm. when I did drag yeah. because I was like, even though I have like tits and hips and a body and hair, but I'm like, <laughs> I wanted to kind of break that barrier. Mm. And that's, you know, back in when we first started in 2017, that was new. Now yeah. we have a lot of, yeah. New, yeah. we have a lot of famous bearded queens, which is great. Mm. But yeah, that's something that we had to sort of deconstruct. I love that. And to like bacon and affirmation too for people at home is something that Heath said earlier is like, 
like non-binary can look like so many different things mm-hmm. and there's actually no rule book and that's kind of the point. Yeah. It can look like whatever feels right to you. I think so often the media makes it seem like non-binary is like complete androgyny. Like it's like yeah. the yeah. exact middle yeah. of yeah, exactly. masculinity and femininity. And they treat it's like, it's like, like no. a third gender on its yeah. own. You're like, no, it's not that. <laughs> it's whatever feels right yeah. for you. And I think that's been kind of my process of figuring out what it looks like for me. I actually haven't changed very much of how I look. Mm. It's literally just like figuring out like what things I'm doing that actually aren't for me and then mm-hmm. removing those. But of course, it's still pretty new. So I would say mostly Check it later. it's your energy that has changed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like how you perceive things, how you approach things, your attitude mm-hmm. so- towards certain things. Yeah. I think you definitely used to confine yourself to a specific box, which mm-hmm. was like the box of a societal woman. And now and I'm now- a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yeah, like that's gender. Yeah. Bitch. <laughs> So (laughs) for both of you, when did you first realize that you weren't cisgender? Mm. And how did you come to the label non-binary? Like, how did Mm. it feel right for you? So I was born uh, in Egypt and I grew up in the Middle East. Mm. Um, I only came here when I was 18, which was like 2006. And obviously growing up in a Muslim family in a conservative environment, uh, gender roles are very strict. But I was thankful enough that my family, even though they are Muslim, they're quite secular. We always had fun in terms of being able to dress up and do other things. I remember we had like, even in school, you have like spirit week and whatever, and you can like switch genders. Spirit in week. school? In school. What love. year was this? This is like in elementary. What? Yeah. Fantastic. yeah. I yeah. never had this. Yeah. <laughs> like and this was, in, this was in Kuwait as well. No way. Yeah. Interesting. Was yeah. it a public school, a Catholic school? It, no, or it, was a, it was an school? international was it? American school. <laughs> and I always loved that aspect of like dressing up and performing. I was always like very artsy. And so this idea of like pushing gender boundaries was kind of part of my life. I really like to dress up as well. Like, am I, at, back then, it was like, am I a transsexual? Am I a transvestite? Like, what's the tea? But even when I came out, I remember my mom being like, oh, so do you want to become a woman kind of thing? And I was like, no, I feel comfortable in my body. I don't know, you know, like, even though I'm comfortable in my body, I still like to do these things where I'm not in my body. And it wasn't until I started really getting to drag like heavily and like performing as halal that I was like, I really like this character and I really like this person who I am on stage, but it just felt good. And I felt like, oh, I'm really living my like femme fantasy. And it started to very much bleed into my like everyday life. And then the more that I thought about it, the more that I started to be like, I think this is what I am. I think this is Mm. what I want to be. When you say like you felt really comfortable in like the drag queen body, but you were also mentioning in your your past answer that your reason for not wanting to explore your femininity outside of that is like a concern for safety. Yes. If that wasn't a concern for you, is that like something you'd want to do more of? Probably. I'm sure we're going to get into gender dysphoria, but uh, Mm -hmm. that's definitely something that I struggle with because a lot of times like I felt really beautiful in Mm. drag I felt special I felt sexy and I didn't I don't feel that way outside of drag there was a moment I think it was maybe like during the pandemic where I was like do I want to transition and I was like looking at pictures of me in drag I I don't have any pictures of myself like in public life Mm. like as me and there's a reason for that I'm not a very comfortable person showcasing the way that I look out of drag and so I was like oh maybe that's the life that I want to lead honestly it's still kind of like up in the air for me yeah yeah how about you, Heath? When did you realize that you weren't cisgender? I knew since I was like a kid. Like I remember I would be with my friends who were girls and I was mm-hmm. like, I was like, I'm doing girl wrong. Like all the time. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I can't like wrong. get this thing right. Like it's it's like if a bunch of dancers are doing splits and you can't get them and you're yeah. like, my muscles are still there. Like I don't yeah. get what's happening. I was like, something's different. And it's also like coming <laughs> up as a kid, like I grew up in Northern Ontario, I grew up in mm. Sudbury and like my family's Colombian. And so mm. in my brain, I was like, oh, it must be just because I'm like one of the immigrant kids. So I was like, that's why. I was like, yeah. I don't get the social views. Like it's different. Like, I don't know. Yeah. But then I would look at boys and I'd be like, mm, that's not it. When I'm hanging out with my trans men friends and I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm not a man. Like I was like, <laughs> I laugh at them sometimes because we'll be hanging out and I'm like, oh, gender's happening. I'm like, it's real. Yeah. And I'm like, it's, it's not for me. But as a kid, I thought, so like, do you remember the show ER? No, yes. but go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's a show, it was like Grey's Anatomy of okay. the 90s. And there's an episode where a little kid on it was intersex. Mm. And I remember watching it and being like, that's it. 
And so within the episode, there's a little girl who comes in and she was sick and then they do an ultrasound and then they found out that she had testes. But as a kid, I was like, it was my only reference for anything outside of gender. Yeah. Mm. And within the episode, the parents didn't want to tell her. And then when the doctor doesn't feel ethical about it and like ends up telling her because she's like, I know something's weird. I know you're not telling me something. Then he tells her and she was like, oh, I'm a boy. Like you need to not let them take this out of me. And then I was watching it and I was like, maybe that's it. I was like, I must just have testes. So I, since childhood, like kept begging my mom for ultrasounds. And she was like, why? Like, this is so random. Like, this doesn't make any sense. And I was like, they must find my testes. Because <laughs> then everything will make sense. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, just trust me, mom. Literally, yeah. I was like, I know. I watched a TV show. But I also wouldn't tell her where it was coming from. I was like, yeah. I just need an ultrasound. <laughs> and she was like, what in the world? I was like, very specific medical yeah. request from a child. Yeah. And then, like, I started getting my period. And I would get the worst pain, like, waking up mm. at... 3 a.m. screaming in pain and that's how I knew my period arrived like yeah. horrible and I was like it's the testy because I remember the little girl had <laughs> abdominal pain and that's why she was there and I was like this makes sense so I literally if you look at my medical history there's just like charts and charts and charts because eventually now that I had like a reason to go mm -hmm. I just kept getting ultrasounds because I was like they're missing them <laughs> and I'd be laying on the table and like they can't tell you anything when you're there and I'd yeah. be lying there and be like but do you see anything different? Yeah. And the, liter the practitioner was like uh, we can't really tell you anything I was like but is there anything there that shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was like oh my god my kid just like uh, wants yeah. to not be in pain and I was like have you found the organs? <laughs> like, I was just waiting and it's funny like I forgot about the the ultrasound things and like I like started exploring gender and stuff and I, I had abdominal pain and like had to go to the hospital and I had to get an internal ultrasound and then my brain was like they'll find the testes and I was like <laughs> and this is after I'd already like yeah. figured stuff out and I was yeah. like oh my god I forgot about this thing about myself <laughs> I forgot about my like, testicles it was like <laughs> so <laughs> deeply rooted in like my childhood and I was like oh my god the fact that my like childhood self knew but just didn't have like language for yeah. it it didn't have like any references to what it may be. Also, there wasn't anyone who really looked like me in media that I'd be yeah. like, oh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I learned about they, them pronouns as like an option because I was dating someone and they were telling me tea about a party that they had been to and they were referencing someone and they were like, yeah, and then they were making out with so-and-so and I was like, how many people were making out? Like, what? Whoa, wait, wait, like, what's happening? And they're like, oh no, it's just this pronoun, whatever. And I remember sitting there and we were like eating dumplings. And I was like, don't be weird. Don't be weird. Because as soon as they explained it, I was like, that's me. Everything is like clicking and making sense. And then shortly after, I worked on a show that was written by a non-binary or genderqueer writer. Mm -hmm. My idea of what gender presentation was and could be started shifting which was like such a gift and then the access to being able to see like effeminate trans men and yeah. being able to see like mm -hmm. androgynous like uh, trans women and like mm -hmm. non-binary people who like presented across the board right and like of different ages of different cultures like mm -hmm. I'd never seen a Latina person transition yeah. like I just didn't have an example of it mm -hmm. and so I was like I don't even know what it would look like for me yeah. if I did. I think it's so <laughs> funny when really conservative political people say that giving representation of different gender roles or even the lack of gender in a role is actually going to confuse kids when it actually provides more access and mm -hmm. info into what you could be. Because mm -hmm. I think that based on what you're explaining, not having the representation created more confusion. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. yeah. I yeah. was looking for organs that didn't exist. Like, <laughs> yeah. With kids, people are like, oh, like, what if it's dangerous? Like, what if they try something? They I'm like, kids pretend to have invisible friends. Yeah. yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Like, I think there's nothing wrong with supporting a kid in terms of them knowing more mm. about the world. A dangerous thing would be knowing not enough. The first thing that happens within when we look at examples of like genocide is like limiting access to knowledge, limiting access to books mm -hmm. to education and it's like when you look at that in relationship to gender and presentation they're gonna go outside and walk through the world mm -hmm. they may as well know what's in it and yeah. also if it means yeah. that your kid gets to understand themselves better or explore mm -hmm. something guess what yeah. happens and your kid is happier yeah the interesting thing that both of you have been exploring here is the element of transness that's mm -hmm. also like tied into being non-binary as well for me 
there's never been like any desire to transition at all. Mm-hmm. Like I've always felt like good in my body. But I'm wondering in what ways gender dysphoria shows up for folks who are non-binary and in what ways you think it differs from the trans experience and like maybe mm-hmm. how you've decided to add in that like trans label too and like why that felt right for you. But before we get into that, this podcast is proudly sponsored by Vizzy Heart Seltzer. And with Vizzy's vibrant flavors, you can now follow your own vibe. For those of you who know Queer Collective, you know that Vizzy has been a longtime supporter of us and our mission to create accurate and positive representation for the entire queer community. So if you are a hard seltzer drinker, we highly recommend drinking and supporting one that you know also supports the queer community. And now back to the episode. For me personally, there's always been an element of dysphoria that comes with being non-binary. I present very hyper mask. Mm. I'm like bald and I have like a lot of body hair and I have Mm. a lot of facial hair. And so it's like really easy for me to be coded. And so to break out of that, it becomes a very sort of difficult conversation internally to have because you're like, well, do I have to remove all those things that make me a man Mm. so that I can become non-binary? For me, it's the answer obviously is no. But that was something that I've struggled with for a long time. Approaching the conversation around transness for myself Mm -hmm. was even further away because you're like, well, not only do I have to get rid of all the things, all Mm -hmm. the features that are supposedly making me me, Mm -hmm. but I have to do like additions or Mm -hmm. extractions or things to like Mm -hmm. my physical self Mm -hmm. so that I can conform to what it means to be trans in society. And I think that that's an issue not with how we define transness or how we define Mm non-binary individuals, but I think it's how society's expectations on how you should look or behave Mm -hmm. in those you know, in those roles. One end of the spectrum, you're going to have conservatives who either oppose your transition completely Mm -hmm. or who expect you to transition to the binary code that they expect you to do. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. it has perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, so you want to transition? You have to be like the most hypersexualized like female image of like what it means to be female. And then you have another end of the spectrum where there are people who are trans who want to present in one of those binaries, Mm -hmm. very much so, and feel either devalued or they devalue you based Mm -hmm. on how much or how little you're doing Mm -hmm. to conform to that idea. So it's like, can you, you know, claim transness Mm -hmm. without impeding on the experiences that trans folk go through, especially ones who are visibly trans Mm -hmm. and who can't get away with passing? I'm less concerned about the conservatives. (laughs) I'm more more concerned about the people in my community Mm -hmm. and not being the person who is, Mm -hmm. you know, taking up space when I don't think I should be taking up that space. Mm -hmm. Over the last, I think, two to three years is when I really be comfortable in being like, you know what? I don't need to do any of the things that are expected of me. I don't Mm -hmm. need to present a certain way. I can just do what I want and feel comfortable. Mm. Also, like, the ideas of what it means to transition are often so tied to, like, gender in relationship to whiteness. Mm. And it's, Mm -hmm. like, we see the way that black women have their gender Mm. policed constantly. It's, like, the idea of, like, a hairy woman. It's, like, surprise, like, yeah, most ethnic Mm. people are real. I'm, like, I was super hairy as a kid. And I was, like, does this mean I'm a boy? And my mom was, like, no, we're Colombian. Like, that's why. I was, like, I gender-wise feel the same before and after tea. I just, like, have a cool beard now, which is weird. And, like, my voice got lower, but it still sounds really gay. When it comes to the idea of labels and like mm-hmm. the permissions of like being able to use it for not I'm like mm-hmm. if it feels right to you, use it I think also yeah. like the mm-hmm. opportunity within language is that it does evolve just like we yeah. as people evolve over time and I think that like presentation shouldn't have to be in relationship to it I think also like the idea of taking up space within th- something I'm like mm-hmm. If it feels right, then like, what is the space you're taking from, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in terms of taking up space, I think there's space for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if mm-hmm. it feels right for you yeah. and then if it changes later on, then you can change it. I've never really wanted to change anything about myself to the extent where I would actually change it. Mm-hmm. However, there's plenty of times and reflecting back even on my childhood where I have felt more like a woman or I've felt more like a boy Mm -hmm. or I felt like more of like an in-between and I remember when I was a kid I would watch like tv shows and stuff like that and I would never really like relate to the girls on the Mm -hmm. tv shows I would relate to like the boys and Mm -hmm. then I would like even though I had long ass hair I would literally try to style my hair (laughs) like the boys did back in the day and I would like 
kind of like put it up in a bun and like the top I would try to like spike it up because spiking it it was like the so thing good. it was like yeah. the style but obviously it didn't work because I had long hair and like to have spiky hair you have to have it short but that also speaks very much to the idea that like you don't have to physically like surgery or, or, or be on hormones to have like gender affirming practices like you can mm-hmm. cut your True. hair you can True. wear makeup yeah. you can get fillers mm-hmm. you know like yeah. like that is gender affirming mm-hmm. like i yeah. see a lot of guys who get like jaw filler or this mm-hmm. fill, and you're like girl you want to look more mask like yeah. that's you yeah. gender affirming yeah 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 <laughs> in doing research for this episode i found that a lot of folks do use non-binary as like a stepping stone to transness but mm-hmm. they are two separate identities too and that's like one thing i want to emphasize for people the two like they're separate identities but they can also be used together at like very happily like you mm-hmm. are figuring out how you identify is very much just trying things on for yourself yeah and mm-hmm. like seeing what fits for you for me like just even to give folks like a different perspective non-binary kind of feels like my my final boss for now check in in yeah. five years i guess yeah. there might be new words in yeah. five years we'll see the sequel I, I think like the dysphoria that i felt was very small like i've always felt right in like my physical body i also feel connected to womanhood in ways but i realized that like my connection to womanhood was more so in terms of like feeling politically aligned with it Mm -hmm. that's also why i felt so connected to like being a lesbian before i changed like my label to bisexual and like i was having a really hard time letting go of it it's how people are reading me and i can't help that just because of how i'm presenting so i'm like i still feel connected in that way but like i don't actually feel aligned with what being a woman is the experience of like dysphoria for me like the biggest one was sorry to my sister if she's watching but it was having to like be her maid of honor in her Mm. wedding and like having to wear like a gown it felt so wrong and like I don't honestly I don't really wear dresses Mm. and it just felt like a performance of femininity Mm. and then it also being in a wedding setting felt like so wrong Mm, to me on so many levels for months leading up to it like I felt so much anxiety around it and then I think it was my mom or maybe you I can't remember who told me but they were like you're playing a role oh that was me (laughs) yeah it was you and like that worked for me I was like yeah. this is a performance and I'm performing yeah. femininity it's right a character now. yeah and that's when I realized I was like whoa like that is really what womanhood is like mm-hmm. that is like so ingrained in what yeah. it means and I feel so not aligned with it yeah. that's an experience a lot of queer people have like yeah. and, and a lot of racialized people have like mm-hmm. the idea of like code switching yeah mm-hmm. and that's very it you're like performing that mm-hmm. right like you're performing straightness you're performing whiteness you're performing yeah. whatever my voice is in a high octave uh, yeah. Everybody thinks I'm a woman when I'm on the phone. <laughs> I don't mind. I love it. But uh, do I you remember ever do once, like a sex like, call line. Yeah, exactly. You're like, uh, is it pepperoni? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the white sauce. Get the white sauce. <laughs> well, I remember once when, like, my brother. This was like back when. I was just starting university. Mm -hmm. My brother was like visiting from abroad. And he's like, do you know that like when you speak to people, you don't speak to them the same way that you speak to us? And Mm -hmm. I was like, what? And he's like, you speak much higher to like everybody else. Mm -hmm. when, But when you speak to us, like my family, Mm -hmm. you don't. It's true. And I didn't at the time, I didn't have a word for it. I didn't know what code switching was. But I was like, right, I was performing straightness this whole time. And I just didn't know it. Is speaking kind of on the cultural side, I'm wondering for all of our like cultural backgrounds, like racial backgrounds, if there have been specific expectations for masculinity and femininity growing up. Mm. I know we got like two Hispanics over here and I know that's intense. Two Colombians over here. I definitely think that there is a high expectation Mm -hmm. on Middle Eastern cis men to perform masculinity. And I don't think that's just a childhood thing. I, that's mm. something that has that continues to be a part of my life. I'm not allowed to be like femme. I'm not allowed to be non-binary. I'm not even allowed to do drag. I remember when I I would have like grinder hookups or whatever, and they'd be like, "Oh, you do drag? Like, I'm not interested anymore." Mm. You know? Or they'd come to my house and they'd see like a wig. They'd be like, "Oh, do you like dress up?" I'm like, "Yeah," and but like. They see my grinder photos. They're like, yeah, you're cool. Like you can, but whatever. Or, but they hear my voice or they see what I do and it's automatically like a no-go zone, right? There's obviously a very racist history of Middle Eastern men being like angry, mm-hmm. savage, terroristic, whatever you want to call it. A lot of people in the world see 
uh, Middle Easterns as a monolith in terms of mm. like them all being Muslim, which is yeah. obviously not the case. And so there's that added sort of expectation of like, oh, well, Muslim people are very like segregated in the way of thinking of gender. Mm. And then on top of that, you come from this region and you look like that. You have to be this, you know, that doesn't jive well with you being femme, you being queer, you being anything, right? It's something that I constantly have to deal with. And it's something that I always mm. validate my existence outside of that. There was like a turning point for me where I was like, I don't give a shit anymore. And I don't want to have to live by anybody else's ideals. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to do me. And if you don't like it, I don't give a shit. Because I was doing that performance for even people in the queer community. The gay community is very patriarchal. They're very misogynistic. And it definitely feels like there's racial hierarchies. Oh, as well. there's definitely a racial hierarchy. And there's yeah. a there's like a physical hierarchy, right? Yeah. You have like these like white muscle gays who are like yeah. on the top of the pyramid. Yeah. yeah. And and then everything else is lesser than. And even the idea of me performing versatility in mm -hmm. sex was something that was off. It was like, yeah. oh, but you look like a top. You know, and I'm like, yeah. I'm a delicate yeah. top. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Delicate. Keith, for you, how do you feel like your like Hispanic Colombian background? Mm -hmm. How did that um, impact you and like your gender and your own journey? Yeah, it was super specific because they didn't grow up in Colombia. Between me and my parents, we have like mm -hmm. culture clash just because I grew up in a different country, even though right. they moved me here. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. For me, the examples I had of like womanhood mm -hmm. was like, I'm going to grow up. I'm gonna marry a man very young, mm. and he's gonna be my only husband ever. <laughs> and my purpose in life is gonna be to make sure he's happy, no matter how uncomfortable or unhappy I am. And like that's it. And I was like, that sucks. Entering into performance as like an actor, mm -hmm. having to learn advocacy for representation, help me deconstruct my ideas of womanhood. What are the ways that I've been performing? Mm -hmm gender in relationship to race in like a small white town i was already breaking so many of the expectations of like a being mm -hmm. a young daughter to them mm -hmm. like being an artist was controversial oh, yeah <laughs> being yeah, gay yeah. like good yeah. luck have you ever watched the reel before it's like a talk show but it's all women of color okay. at one point adrian bailon from the cheetah girls was on it oh oh i know, I know what you're talking yes. about now yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she was talking about when she was a kid she was like if i would do something dumb fair but mm -hmm. my mom knows who i am as a person and she's like mm -hmm. that's within her character where she was like I also had friends who would do things and then their parents would be like no my perfect angel would never and she was like mm -hmm. at least she knows who I am as a person mm -hmm. and she loves me for who I am as a person when people talk about like coming out and stuff I'm like hey, I don't think it's necessary I think mm -hmm. often like this demand from this like straight heteronormative culture we live in to like have yeah. to come out or have mm -hmm. to disclose things about ourselves to families. I'm like, if it's not right for you, don't do it. If it compromises your self safety and well being, a straight person pressuring you to like come yeah. out or a queer person pressuring you to come out yeah. in a context that doesn't help your life, not helpful. If you preserve your peace by preserving your privacy, then like fine. When I learned that their idea of the only option of being trans in Colombia is that I will die, I was yeah. like, that changes it. My understanding of what it means to be queer here in Canada and mm. their understanding of what it was like to be queer when they were coming to in Colombia, mm. they were like, our kid's going to die. And that to me shifted the way that I would understand them to receive things. Like I was like, you're being homophobic. And I was like, you're scared for my safety yeah, mm -hmm. and approaching them from that angle and being like mm -hmm. there are options for me to like have a nice life there are options for me to be happy mm -hmm. I remember my dad was like if you were like 50 and hadn't been able to get a husband told me you're a lesbian I would understand <laughs> I was like wow. what <laughs> and then but at the same time he was like <laughs> he went from being like you should never have sex even after you get married. You can still wait. You can stay a virgin forever. So then also in that day, he what? was like, like, why don't you want to have sex with men? Like, sex with men is great. And I was like, Dad, if you want to have sex with men, <laughs> yeah. you should. And he was like, oh my God, my mom was dying. She was like, why, why is this my child? And I was like, do you wish that I had just like stayed a girl? And he was like, no. He's like, I think in my head, I understood like that mm. path. He's like, I don't get it. And he's mm. like, I'm not always okay with it. But I knew that if you had stayed a woman, you'd be the saddest woman in the world. Mm. And I was like, the most loneliest uh, woman. Clearly, <laughs> like, here with my husband. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, you don't have to understand someone fully to respect them. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like I know that their resistance comes actually from love mm -hmm. and like wanting me to be safe and to be okay and to have as many opportunities as I can because that's the whole reason why they brought me to Canada in the first yeah. place. Right? Gender and sexuality are very, very tied together. We spoke a lot about this in our episode with Tyra Blizzard, 
talking about um, combat gender and sexuality, which I'd recommend people check out after this episode. Non-binary identities definitely call a lot of people's sexualities into question. A lot of folks wonder, can I still be gay or lesbian and be non-binary at the same time? Am I still Mm -hmm. gay or lesbian if I'm attracted to non-binary people? Or even I just transitioned from, say, female to male, but I still feel like I'm part of the lesbian community. And we wanted to address this in today's episode, specifically because a clip from our last episode with Tyra took off and a lot of people had quite a few things to say about this. Mm -hmm. Do you think it makes sense to continue using these labels if you are non-binary or if you date non-binary people? or do you think that like your own sexuality needs to shift at that point like i know for me that when i came out it made me question how i identify sexually because Mm -hmm. there was a period of my time and like maybe like a decade where i was like quite sure that i was just like i was gay and it wasn't until i sort of fell in love with a trans man that i think things even though they they're men as well it it just changed things for me because again it was quite early like it was back in like 2008 or Mm 9 The education wasn't there. The exposure wasn't there. And so when I fell in love with this trans man, I thought, Mm -hmm. oh, I must be more than just gay. I started to be like, well, if I think that I look sexy in drag, what's stopping me from seeing other people as sexy? Like, I always thought women were sexy. I always thought, like, trans women were sexy. But there was, like, a a, a mental obstacle for myself. But being like non-binary I was like well if I'm fluid in my gender expression and I think everybody's hot that means I should be able to be attracted to everybody so why am I not you know yeah. and it and it <laughs> really put into the person right and I was like wait <laughs> so I am pan but again back then I didn't have that the yeah. pan wasn't also a term that was being used uh, often right it was mm-hmm. either you were you were gay you were bi and I was like but I I, I want more than that Um, I'm a greedy hoe. Let's go. (laughs) It really Mm. opened up my eyes to the possibilities of like what it means to be a certain gender and Mm -hmm. what it means to be attracted to to people. And Mm -hmm. it sort of became more of I'm just attracted to a person rather Mm -hmm. than I'm attracted to a specific like, you know, gender expression or sexuality or anything like that. Taking apart what gender means to me, Mm -hmm. it also allowed me to like look at the people that I'm dating in a really different way and be Mm -hmm. like, honestly, someone's physical form doesn't actually matter that much to me. Like, like you're saying in the beginning Mm -hmm. in terms of how you identify, it's like, I'm attracted to queerness. I'm attracted Mm -hmm. to other people who have taken apart these systems and like can meet me where I'm at with that now. And like that I find really sexy. For you, Heath, though, I remember you saying like you identified as a lesbian too and now you feel like sometimes like outside of that community like how does that feel for you i don't identify as a lesbian anymore Mm -hmm. when i first like came into my queerness i identified as like a lesbian and bisexual Mm -hmm. a lesbian and bisexual at the same time yeah like as a bisexual lesbian i think i look at it as look at words and like these descriptors as Mm -hmm. opportunities rather than like Mm -hmm. restrictions right like Mm -hmm. theoretically like i know that i can be attracted to a bunch of different people Mm -hmm. in practice i was only at the time really attracted to women I didn't really have a lot of trans men in my life, but I knew when I met them, I was like, yeah. But I was like, I'm attracted to non-binary people. Mm -hmm. I'm attracted to like trans men specifically, but through transition, like chemically, it's really funny because like I just use like pan and queer Mm -hmm. and bisexual interchangeably. But I'm like, I'm only attracted to queer people. Like I'm not Mm -hmm. attracted to straight people at all. Like Mm -hmm. the experience a lot of people have of like falling in love with like your straight best friend or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not attracted (laughs) to straight men. Can't relate. No, can't relate. I don't have it. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not even attracted to like cis gay men necessarily. Like I'm like, I want you to be like super (laughs) fucking queer or whatever. Being gay is so different than being queer yeah, yeah exactly it's really exactly it is. <laughs> but being a it's lesbian different. is not different from being queer and like i don't know how to explain but they that. can be it can, can be depends be. on the they person can they can be yeah i like, think it's because like women also have like been historically subjugated to like oppression yeah. and, and yeah. men yeah. haven't so i think lesbians align mm-hmm. a lot more with queerness than yeah. like yeah. gay men who can just travel the world yeah. without having yeah. to worry about that there are yeah. a few that do hold on to like very Mm -hmm. strict definitions and gender Mm -hmm. roles when it comes to like being a lesbian and i think that those people are the same people that are also like 
trans exclusionary. Mm-hmm. Like, if a gender role works for you, fantastic. Mm-hmm. You can't then demand it of someone else. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can't have your behavior if it's negatively affecting someone mm-hmm. else in a way that is like actively violent or mm-hmm. like hateful. Then it's not about the gender role. It's about you being yeah. discriminatory or prejudiced or whatever. Yeah. I understand the protections of it also sometimes mm-hmm. in the sense that like lesbians have actively been pushed out of gay movements, actively mm-hmm. pushed out of gay spaces. Like when mm-hmm. I first came into the scene in Toronto, I was actively told like the village you're not allowed in it because you're taking space from gay men we need to discuss the misogyny within our own community Mm -hmm. and understanding Mm -hmm. that like just because you exist within womanhood Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't embody misogyny just because you've experienced oppression does Mm -hmm. not mean that now you have permission to be the oppressor oh it's a big part of the gay community yeah says gay men like oppress other like racialized groups they oppress like other genders like all the time and it's rampant still I think it's also like the importance of understanding queer history trans men have always been part of lesbian spaces Mm -hmm. knowing that's really important because then it also changes how you interact with the space and how you interact with people in it just be nice to people it's not hard (laughs) well we had a really (laughs) interesting comment on our video recently from our friend Alina that I think like ties into all of this and like Mm -hmm. speaks to it really well but it lesbians have always had a complex relationship with gender and womanhood because at its core being a lesbian is the antithesis of what it means to be a woman in society centering men and being appealing to men Mm -hmm. so one could argue that all lesbian identities are gender non-conforming in some way so non-binary and trans men lesbians anyone using the label in good faith is valid in it which I thought that was like a very interesting approach to it that also tied into like my understanding of like the real difference in how lesbianism feels a lot more queer to me than being in like a gay space especially like a white gay space Mm -hmm. because there isn't like those layers of marginalization tied to it this advocacy for like the importance of being like yes like trans women are allowed in these spaces that are queer whatever whatever but you have to know that within that they're going to present in a lot of different ways and you have to advocate for that. Women are going to come in with beards because they're coming from like walking down the street trying to be safe or like that's yeah. just what they look like or they don't want to transition or whatever. Yeah. Like that's still a trans woman. When it comes to trans masculinity, it's really weird that you come up as a woman mm. and you're conditioned to like be quiet and not speak up and mm. all these different things and then you transition into masculinity and like the misogyny shifts where all of a sudden you go to say something you're like, I found my voice now and people are like, you're taking up space as a man. It's a really nuanced and complex thing. Thing, right and it's yeah. like conversations I've had with lots of my trans femme friends where they're mm. like I sometimes in certain rooms people assumed that I took in the world as a man but I was a woman operating as someone mm-hmm. who like passed as a man yeah. and she's like a white person she was like I yeah. did learn how to take up space in a way that you've never ever had the privilege of even perceiving mm. so you it never occurs to you to even try to take that up if you're going to advocate for the importance of mm. like trans women and non-binary AMA people getting to come in and present mm-hmm. in whatever way like that has to apply for trans non-binary people as well that has yeah. to have an understanding of like the culture around trans men as well and the mm-hmm. fact that like we are not welcome in these other spaces that they are yeah. spaces that like they've helped build for a long time I'm also very aware of like my relationship to that yeah. and like not taking space out of spaces that I see are so important and like needed yeah. and I'm like if I understand the need of it mm. then I need to understand my relationship mm-hmm. to it but it's yeah. complicated yeah. yeah that's also why I feel like queer spaces specifically are so magical and beautiful because it is a space where like everyone can come together and it's like it doesn't matter if you're in like a hetero presenting relationship even mm-hmm. if like someone's trans in that relationship or like both people are bisexual yeah. it's like, like there's yeah. no trans one's people. judging you yeah. the f- biphobia like the transphobia that exists within our community it internalizes into you and I think it can make it really hard to let go of a label that like helped you find your community that's also why I think I use bisexual lesbian for a moment there because I'm like fuck like I found so much of who I am and so much community so much like love and friendship the idea of like queer spaces like exclusively queer spaces is also something that's new right there's a lot of elders or people in the community who attach themselves to this identity because they were part of a movement that was trying to be very visible so like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lesbians or or whatever and now those are being broken down Mm -hmm. and so for them it's a fear response it's like oh we've done so much work to be so visible and now Mm -hmm. you don't even want to be like gay anymore you don't want to be a lesbian anymore and i think that there's that Mm -hmm. disconnect and it all stems from this idea of Mm -hmm. like are we representing the people that are have fought for our rights and Mm -hmm. what are we doing with it now it's a really good point like that's definitely where a lot of the fear comes from Mm -hmm. i think it's about honoring the history Mm -hmm. but also recognizing like how the history was trans exclusionary like how Mm -hmm. it was like exclusionary there was a lot of like phobias a lot of like racial issues 
issues going on in like so much of our history and like being really honest and real about that Mm -hmm. and like that is why we're moving forward in a different way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's like a similar argument to when your immigrant parents are like I fought so hard to bring you to this country and this is what you do with it you're like no but like actually (laughs) because I'm in this country I can do it like this is what freedom looks like this is what expression looks like you Mm. should be happy for me that like we're moving it forward this is what progression looks like Mm -hmm. and it's not a disrespect to the history or how we Mm -hmm. got here it's actually just carrying it forward yeah Mm -hmm. but it's a good analogy very much much. (laughs) (laughs) the next piece i wanted to talk about is kind of how non-binariness has like in general terms like non-binary definitely came into the public consciousness very recently and like when we looked at google trend searches to see when this rise in popularity took place we saw that like it wasn't in use on google at all until june 2014 happy pride (laughs) and by 2019 the term really skyrocketed skyrocketed and was classified by google as a breakout term which means that it grew by more than five thousand percent there's a correlation there with like a study with UK gender clinics had reported a 4,400% increase in teen girls seeking treatment for gender dysphoria in the past 10 years. And many people argue that this rise in youth identifying as non-binary is a fad or a social contagion. And I'm wondering if we think this is a valid argument. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we think this is such a phenomenon right now? I think with any sort of progressive uh, movements, there's always going to be a certain amount of visibility that takes place. And then because of that, people start to understand who they are a lot Mm -hmm. more, right? And I think if we were having this conversation 30 years ago, and if Google was around 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, we would have been like, (laughs) oh, what are the Google searches for gay and lesbian? Or what are you know what I mean? Like during like the 70s and 80s, it would have skyrocketed, right? right? Because you're like, oh, there's They're in the news, they're Mm -hmm. in this, they're like, there's that one gay character in the show or whatever, right? With the sort of really big focus on like queer issues over the past 10 to 20 years, I think that has helped a lot in terms Mm -hmm. of how we start to view gender. I think there's a lot of pop culture that is is also plays into it. I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I don't usually give props to like drag race or any of that reality television stuff mm-hmm. but we're not giving her flowers giving her flowers but a lot of these types of shows mm-hmm. have really pushed the boundary of what it means to be gender queer and to yep. represent in a different way obviously now there's a lot of other shows that have you know mm-hmm. like trans trans mass presenting people mm-hmm. and like non-binary folk and mm-hmm. so it's really great to see that being so out there and mm-hmm. with kids as like digital natives, you know, who've had access to the internet for the Mm -hmm. last 10 to 20 years, the dissemination of information is only going to get larger and larger. And I think that the focus of the media and politicians on it mm. on the trans issue mm. I think has also really highlighted this as well and it has yeah. made people a lot more aware and comfortable in being able to express themselves I think it's very true yeah. I mean even just you telling your your testes story yeah. about like that it's being your so only representation yeah. Yeah. Exactly. that's all I had but you yeah. were confused that one intersex character that's the, that's the only thing only you variable yeah. for yeah. anything outside of male and female and yeah. I was like Gotcha. Yeah. And that's the thing is like very much what you're saying. Like these kids have so much more representation because that's really what a lot of our generation has fought for because we're like, mm-hmm. holy shit, it took me so long to figure this out. And I was so confused because I mm-hmm. didn't see it anywhere. Mm-hmm. But now they get to see it, which is lovely. And they even have access to like resources on the internet. But I'm wondering like as so much new language around queerness is becoming so accessible to young people online, how do we think we should be guiding kids and youth in our lives as they explore gender and queerness. As someone who's once a child. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's complicated. I, also, like, I'm not a parent. Yeah. Like, access to language mm. is only ever more helpful. Like, access mm. to information is helpful. I think about the kids I've worked with, like, mm. through drag and through acting, I've gotten to do, like, go speak at GSAs mm. and, like, work with, like, a bunch of different youth. And it's so funny because I'm, like, not a kid person. So most mm. of the time I'm like, don't mess <laughs> yeah. up. Like, don't give mm. them a core memory that's going to ruin yeah. their life. 
<laughs> they already have their own opinions about yeah. the world. They already have yeah. their own perceptions of the world. If you are prioritizing their happiness, mm. that's number one. And then figure out the safeties around making sure that they can have the most access yeah. to safety that they can. Yeah. I think also we often forget that like not every kid has the access that like a young child does that's like in a progressive school in Toronto. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And like I didn't have a GSA in my school. I had a mm. nuns yeah. in my school. Yeah. So like coming here, I was like, wow, like the world is better now. Yeah. And then I was doing a show last year in Winnipeg. And in the show, like I was playing a trans man mm. and then the other character is also queer is written by a trans mass non-binary like playwright mm. and like m most of our like crew mm. was queer the feedback we got from a bunch of the kids was that like it wasn't even about the show they were mm -hmm. like I didn't know you could grow up and be trans like I didn't know I had the option and they were like I wasn't going to transition because I like thought I would die if yeah. your kids idea of life is that by being true to themselves they're going to die mm. or that they're unlovable. That's a red flag for something bigger. I think the rise of Google searches for what it means to be non-binary mm. and trans, to me, it's more mm. so speaks to how dysfunctional gender roles in society is and how mm. much of a disservice it is doing to people that don't identify within the binary. Like mm. we said, it's like things are very fluid and like you never know they might try this on as like many kids do. You're exploring yourself mm -hmm. and they may like feel it's not for them, you know, mm -hmm. or they may feel like it does fit really well and like I think that's just something to hold space for and to like allow kids to explore with a sense of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So for our final question, some would argue that we shouldn't change our systems and language for a minority group, aka us, and also <laughs> stating that the gender binary is a biological fact. <laughs> You're wrong. What would you say to these folks very gently? <laughs> First of all, who's telling you that that's a fact? Uh, that's number one. A lot one. of mean people in yeah. comments. Hello. Yeah. Fight <laughs> 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 them for me. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I think that as a society, we have a lot of people who of our minority status. Just because something is not the majority doesn't mean that we don't change as a society collectively for mm -hmm. people. We change language all the time. Language is constantly being updated. Mm -hmm. Every year, new words are being added to dictionaries. Mm -hmm. Older words are being left behind. Even just take like the idea of like speaking to somebody in Arabic, if anybody mm -hmm. knows Arabic, you speak to each other in dialects. Mm -hmm. If somebody came up to me and spoke to me like traditional Arabic, which I read and write, mm -hmm. I'd be like, who the fuck are you talking to? <laughs> like, what? Why are you yelling at me in like old English? Like, I don't know what's going on here. Right? And so that changed. Like, people don't yeah. speak like that to each other. It's yeah. weird. Just like with slang, there's new words that come. There's mm -hmm. new things that happen. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm learning new shit like Riz and like yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and Riz. like, I don't know yeah. what, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's for a new generation, right? Yeah. And they make up their, Gen Z is a minority in our society right now, yeah. right? And yet we still have language that caters to them. Yeah. And that's the exact same thing with, you know, using queer language. Mm -hmm. Just because a physically disabled person is the minority, does that mean that we're not going to like build ramps, for example, exactly. for access for them? Yeah. Yes. To yeah. change language is easier than that. Yeah. yeah. And I think that sometimes it's examining like why someone's like hesitant or mad about it. Yeah. Sometimes it comes from a fear of like messing up. Because mm. I think like when people look at cancel culture, they're going to mess up a pronoun and then get canceled and lose my job and whatever. And I'm like, <laughs> if you're coming from a place of like wanting to do mm -hmm. right by someone mm -hmm. and you're so scared that you're going to mess up that you go in the whole other direction, I'm like, yeah. It's it's better to like try and get it wrong. Also, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I misgender my friends all the time. Yeah, I have stopped introducing people <laughs> to each other with names because everyone transitions and everyone has different pronouns. And some of my friends have performer names and personal names and legal names. That's and it. I'm like, I'm not gonna say the wrong one. So when I introduce people, I say, "Have you met?" And I wait. <laughs> yeah. and I say nothing. Have you met? <laughs> and that's it. When you look into information, for example, like look at it from a perspective that isn't yours mm -hmm. and then also your own. If yeah. you are so convinced that you are right, then like you're still going to be right at the end of the day, I guess. <laughs> I don't need to understand how a plane flies to be able to understand that it works and get on it and get to mm -hmm. my destination. Mm -hmm. You don't need to understand everything about someone mm -hmm. to respect them. Mm -hmm. And I think that respect can be so basic and to have such yeah. like intense pushback to something. I'm mm -hmm. like, if your freedom d is dependent on someone else's oppression, mm -hmm. we're just not going to get along. Beautifully said. I think that's yeah. a great place to leave it off.
So thank you so much to Halal Bay and Heath for joining our podcast today and providing all the beautiful context that you gave. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast app, make sure to leave us a five-star review because it really does help the podcast out. If you want to dive deeper into your own gender and sexuality exploration, we have an entire episode on it with Tyra Blizzard. It's called, Am I Straight or Is It Compulsory Heterosexuality? That's everything that we got. And until next time... (gasps) Peace.